Hi there, this is Kaisa again. Welcome back to the introductory lecture on zonation. At this point you already know what zonation is. That is, it is both a conservation prioritization framework and a software that runs the prioritization calculations. In the second part of our lecture, we dig deeper into the outputs of a zonation analysis. We learn how the process of prioritization is translated into a rank priority map and what is meant by a performance curve. In addition, I will explain how zonation is able to feed into the process of land use planning. In the previous part of this video lecture, I talked about the inputs of a zonation prioritization and I explained the basic principles of how the analysis works. Now let's take a closer look at the outputs that zonation produces. The first basic output of a zonation analysis is a rank priority map. The rank map reflects the process of the iterative location removal, thus it is created on the basis of the input biodiversity features, the chosen cell removal rule and additional optional analytical parameters. This rank map here shows the region of Uusima in southern Finland and the analysis output depicted here is one part of the analysis done by Kuustera and colleagues. They contributed to the fourth regional plan for the helsinki Uusima region by detecting important locations in terms of green infrastructure and sustainable development. In the map, the least valuable cells within the analyzed landscape are marked with blue color and the top priority locations are marked with red. The rank priority roughly shows the proceeding of the cell removal. Blue cells are removed first and red cells remain last. Do note that this rank priority map was not the final output of the analysis done by Kuustera and colleagues. The development of the spatial prioritization and the creation of rank priority maps is an iterative process in itself. As the prioritization analysis is refined in a stepwise manner, the priority maps change accordingly. So, when additional parameters are included, the analysis output can change significantly. Next, let's add a connectivity parameter to the prioritization. Now we see that the priority areas have become more aggregated within the landscape. Taking connectivity into account makes the top priority location spatially more clumped. Increased aggregation may make the rank priority map seem more neat, but let's think a bit what adding connectivity actually means. Including connectivity means that some of the locations that have high conservation value on the basis of their biodiversity attributes are now given less value by the prioritization. Thus, these sites receive a lower rank. They fall behind in this output when compared to the previous rank map that was drawn without the connectivity parameter. The choice of whether to emphasize connectivity or not importantly contributes to the model of conservation value upon which the analysis runs. The choice to emphasize connectivity also significantly changes the spatial output of the prioritization. This has huge practical meaning in land use planning, including land use designation and implementation. Okay, remember how I explained earlier that there are always constraints to land use planning? Constraints too can be included in the prioritization analysis. And if we wish to produce implementable plans, constraints should always be taken into account. In this case, certain areas defined in the earlier regional plans could be included to bring realism into the output. As the priority here is to detect the valuable nature sites, we need to include existing protected areas into the analysis. 
Let's do that. As a result, existing protected areas are given higher conservation value by default. In more technical terms, this means that the prioritization forces selected sites to the top fraction of the prioritization. These locations become the last ones to be removed from the landscape. In this case, these sites include locations designated in previous land use zoning processes. These include, for example, Natura 2000 areas, established protected areas, conservation program areas, protected habitats, and so forth. These sites already are under legal restrictions, so it is reasonable to emphasize their conservation importance in the prioritization. Note that the connectivity parameter is still included in this analysis. This rank priority map shows nicely how the existing protected areas are given the highest conservation value and nearby sites with significant values are ranked close to them. So this output gives good suggestions for additional spatially targeted conservation or nature management action to support the existing protected area network. Okay, let's switch from maps to curves. The second key output of a zonation analysis is a statistical one. It is the so-called performance data that can be used to draw performance curves for each biodiversity feature used in the analysis. In this figure, the cell removal process is depicted on the x-axis and it starts from the left and proceeds to the right. At the start of the prioritization, all cells are present in the landscape, and this equals to a situation where all landscape is conserved. At the end of the prioritization, all cells have been removed, and thus 0% of the landscape is under conservation. The y-axis then shows the percentage of remaining distribution for each feature. In the beginning of the prioritization, all cells remain and thus all features are intact. This point is at the high end of the y-axis. The analysis ends at the point where all cells are removed. This point is found at the low right hand end of the figure. There the values of both x and y-axis are zero. Let's think how one biodiversity feature performs during the prioritization. If we look at certain points along the prioritization, we see that a curve forms between the two axes. In the beginning of the analysis, all locations or the whole distribution of that feature is present in the landscape. As the prioritization proceeds, cells with least conservation value are removed first, and both the proportion of conserved landscape and the feature distribution decrease. Finally, zonation sort of runs out of locations to prioritize, and this is the point where the analysis ends. Now we can draw the performance curve using the data points we have. The curve tells us that zonation tried to keep that target feature under conservation as long as possible. For this reason, the relationship between remaining landscape and feature distribution is not a straight linear line. In other words, in the beginning of the analysis, zonation avoided removing those cells where this red feature was present because the feature contributed to the overall conservation value. Okay. So that was the performance of one biodiversity feature. What if we have several features to work with? The prioritization obviously affects the features slightly differently, although the main principle is the same. We have a blue feature, a green feature, and a purple feature. Looking at the big picture, the line for the blue feature lies above the lines of other features. Proportionally, its locations are not removed as fast as the locations of other features. Therefore, the blue feature shows higher conservation value when compared to other features in the prioritization. 
in the end of the prioritization, all locations are removed, thus no feature distributions remain, and the total conservation value of the landscape is zero. As the coverage of feature distribution often equals conservation value, the y-axis in a performance curve graph is often simply named as conservation value. Once more, why we see curves here and not a single straight line? The curves result from two facts. Firstly, Sonation aims to retain all of these features. And secondly, the feature locations are autocorrelated. That is, there is naturally emerging spatial aggregation in the landscape and among the features. Thus, the relationship becomes positively nonlinear. The curved shapes of all features indicate an optimized and balanced solution. If the cell removal was random, then the relationship between the y and the x-axis would be linear. In that case, 50% of removed landscape would remove 50% of conservation value. Finally, we can relate the performance curves to the rank priority map by relating the proportion of conserved landscape or landscape remaining to the rank priority of the cells within the landscape. In order to visualize the connection between feature performance and rank map, Zonation has a default color scheme that shows which locations fall into the top fraction with the highest conservation value. Those are the red cells of the rank priority map and the performance curve shows the extent of feature distributions within those locations. This is the rank priority map that corresponds to the performance curves we just studied. Now we can compare the priority map and the performance curves using the same colors indicating which priority areas correspond to which parts of the performance curve. This comparison allows us to extract any stage of the prioritization and examine it not only spatially on the map, but also in terms of feature performance. For example, we know that the blue cells have been removed first and thus they have little conservation value. From the graph, we see that the removal of blue cells did not affect feature distributions much. Those locations actually did not have that many feature occurrences in them at all. At the other end of the prioritization, the top fraction with red cells shows the most valuable locations. In the graph, we see that the removal of those cells always decreased the coverages of the biodiversity features or weakened the feature performance. This means that all cells within the top fraction hosted biodiversity features that were valuable. The greenish and yellowish cells lie around the middle of the prioritization and cover a relatively large area of the studied landscape. Within this part of the prioritization, zonation has more flexibility in choosing which cells are to be removed does this with the aims of finding a balanced solution where each feature remains in the landscape with the largest possible distribution. Also, other key principles of spatial conservation prioritization take place here. Zonation evaluates the complementarity of candidate cells against each other in relation to the feature representation within cells. Zonation also emphasizes cell-wise feature richness in terms of cost efficiency if that is defined through the usage of additive benefit function. Of course, all elements in the defined model of conservation value affect the cell removal process. That is, the prioritization is the overall outcome of the combination of analyzed biodiversity features, the chosen cell removal rule and other parameters. Note that this zonation solution did not include connectivity or constraints. In this case, the model of conservation value was built on the attributes of the four biodiversity features present in the analysis. This was a very simple case.
it is typical to present refined rank priority maps and performance curves as the final results or outputs of a zonation analysis. However, it is also possible to run certain post-processing analysis in zonation. For example, here in a study by Mikkonen and Moilanen, larger conservation management landscapes were identified. This analysis detected clusters of conservationally valuable locations that lie close enough to each other and share managerial attributes in terms of land use and conservation action. So these two maps are outputs of a same prioritization analysis. Note how the maps convey a different message. On the left, the rank priority map strongly emphasizes Northern Finland, whereas on the right-hand side, the post-processed management landscape map gives more value also to Southern locations. Now that we know what we get out of a zonation analysis, it is time to find out how the results can be utilized. Zonation is a highly usable and convenient tool for informing land use planning. Zonation can synthesize large amounts of spatial information in a very flexible and modifiable way. Land use planning is a broad concept and process that affects basically every function of any society and every member of that society. Land use planning includes defining socially shared targets and operations that have a spatial aspect, such as regional development objectives and actions. Land use zoning or developing physical land use plans in spatial format is an important part of land use planning. The zoning includes designating locations for certain land uses or defined objectives. Land use maps indicate the locations of the designations and in the last century they often were available only in print or drawn maps. So the old land use plans were paper maps and if you wish to see them you needed to go to the office of a respective authority and ask if they could show you the map. The establishment of GIS or geographic information system totally transformed the way land use planning is done. Today, the planning is largely digital and the mapped land use plans are widely available for browsing in the internet. This digital leap made room and created need for spatial planning tools such as Zonation. So Nation obviously is able to contribute to the actual land use zoning, but it can be utilized also to inform normative, strategic and operative land use planning. These latter types of planning differ from each other in terms of time horizon, focus and the level of practicability. Normative, strategic and operative land use planning form different levels of planning that can be related to national, regional and local land use plans. Because land use planning is central to societies and it basically is a key tool to handle and guide many socio-political operations, land use planning is under legal regulation. The structure and the aims of the Finnish land use planning system is defined in the Land Use and Building Act. The Act begins by defining its objective. The Act aims to ensure that, and I quote, the use of land and water areas and building activities on them create preconditions for a favorable living environment and promote ecologically, economically, socially and culturally sustainable development. End of quote. According to the Act, the Council of State may adopt the national objectives concerning land use and regional structure, that is, the central governance is responsible for the nationwide normative planning and any changes to national land use guidelines need to be defined in legislation. A significant part of land use planning is done by regional councils. Regional councils have their own normative and operative functions, but their main planning tool is in strategic land use plans that target the regional level. The regional land use plans often are thematic, meaning that there are separate sectorial plans for industry, traffic and green infrastructure, for example. 
the difficult task of the regional councils is to manage the full range of different land uses and make room for each of them within the region. The regional land use planning must follow the national land use guidelines. Regional Land use plans in turn regulate the local master plans that are made by the municipalities. Local land use planning is largely operative. It focuses on practical measures and spatial implementation of policies. For example, many details related to housing are defined in the local plans. These include building sites, the maximum extent of building per area, even the number of floors of houses is defined. And on some occasions, the colors of roofs can be determined in the local land use plan. Zonation is a useful tool in informing both regional and local land use planning. In Finland, there has been ample interest in zonation applications by regional councils and municipalities alike. So land use planning is always a process. Let me take you through a process model that visualizes the basic principles of regional land use planning. First, we typically start with a problem. And that problem uh, is then defined into an object of planning and also the region or the target area of the planning process is to be defined. This leads to a better specification of the problem. And when we know what is the issue at hand, we typically start to evaluate the present state. And this is sort of like a research um, stage of the planning process. Then we, when we have a good picture of the present state, we can do further analysis and define the targets of planning. So this is like the target based planning stage. Based on the analysis, we can develop alternative draft plans. And here we enter the land use zoning phase. From those alternative drafts, uh, we can pick the best one. We can analyze the alternatives and evaluate them. Then when we are ready to select the best alternative, we enter the realm of decision making. Based on the best alternative, Measures are developed. Measures help us to follow the implementation of the plan. Here we speak about planning for operations, for actual actions. And when uh, the implementation phase has been going on for a while, we can start observing the impacts of the plan. So we start to follow up the planning process and, and its outcomes. So basically, land use planning is an ongoing cycle that aims to repair and adjust itself. The phases of planning, decision making, implementation and follow up or evaluation repeat again and again. This means that land use plans are never ready and land use planning does not have a finishing stage. The work is never ending. Land use planning is increasingly taking ecological factors into account. Ecological aspects are underlined by the sustainable development agenda and the global environmental change emphasizes that land use planning needs also ecological aims in order to hinder climate change and biodiversity loss. Public policies, including land use planning, are under international and national agendas. These agendas set targets for conservation action and the implementation of that action needs to be planned spatially. Environmental issues and conservation problems are so complex that they cannot be solved within people's heads. Those computational tools like zonation are essential. A zonation prioritization can be included in the planning stage of the larger process of land use planning cycle. It always starts with setting of objectives. Next, the ecological model of conservation value needs to be defined as it dictates what is to be prioritized. At this stage, expert knowledge is extremely important in designing the analysis inputs and parameters. 
running the actual prioritization is only a small part of any zonation analysis, although the computations may need several attempts before the analysis setup is final. When the outputs, the rank priority map and performance curves are final, they need to be interpreted. Locations with high conservation value are mapped and examined by the attributes. Possible post-processing of results is done and the results are discussed with stakeholders. All too often zonation projects end at the interpretation phase. It is very important to also validate the results. That is, go to the field and see the priority locations in reality. Typically, the validation work is left to stakeholders, for example, land use planners working for the municipality. If the people who actually conducted the prioritization are not involved in the validation, it may become difficult to develop recommendations for implementation and monitoring of these suggested actions. Again, no zonation prioritization is flawless. As the land use planning in general, also spatial conservation prioritization is a repeatable process. Let's return to the practical reality. During this course, we will utilize the case and data from Helsinki Uusimaa regional planning as an example on how zonation can inform land use planning. The key words in the main aim of the land use plan were competitiveness, well-being and sustainable development. Regional land use planning is long-term work and here too development of the plan took nearly five years to complete. Ecological aspects were seen as important for the plan. The Conservation Biology Informatics Group from University of Helsinki gave important contribution to the regional plan by using zonation as a tool to detect the valuable nature site within the planning region. So they asked, where are the valuable green areas in the Uusimaa region? How to safeguard biodiversity and ecosystem services within the region? Green infrastructure was named as one of the main themes of the regional plan. It included ecological considerations such as biodiversity, ecological networks consisting of habitat patches and corridors connecting the patches, recreational networks defined from human perspective and natural resources and ecosystem services defined in a narrow sense. As a result, in addition to clear biodiversity attributes such as species and habitat information, the zonators used spatial data on ecosystem services provision, conservation implementation, land use and the level of human impact to build the prioritization in the most informative and implementable way. As we already saw, connectivity and constraints were included in the analysis. The level of human impact or anthropogenic influence was estimated based on land cover types and it was broadly equaled with habitat quality. The end solution emphasized sites with high nature value and relatively low human disturbance that had conservational importance also in terms of legislation. The applications of zonation sound almost too good to be true. Well, in fact, there is one huge pitfall. Zonation is extremely sensitive to data quality. If the data on biodiversity features is crappy, so will be the outputs. Garbage in, garbage out. Zonation does not evaluate the correctness of its inputs nor its outputs. That is work that needs to be done by the people who plan, conduct and interpret the prioritization. What is then good and usable data? Data should be relevant, reliable, consistent and recent. In addition, it should have a suitable resolution both spatially and temporally. Given that we live in a world filled with data, and Finland being a country where lots of spatial data is freely available, it is surprising that all zones and analyses end up lacking some kind of data. As spatial prioritizations are typically conducted on landscape level, that is the analysis covers tens or hundreds of square kilometers, it is simply not possible to go and collect the needed data from field. 
Deriving and formatting of spatial data is a resource-hungry process that needs money and labor. That is why data availability and data restrictions need to be carefully considered in any zonation analysis from beginning to the end. Thank you for listening.